All right, uh, it is December, in case you don't know, um, and you haven't heard the music in the malls and the shopping and the chaos and the busyness. And so welcome to What Matters Most, a series that we are kicking off all this month long. And this is part of a 30-day Christmas challenge. Now, the Christmas challenge is uh, the Meeting House and Infinitum joining up in partnership and trying to focus Jesus, what matters the most, even though all of the lists are real and all of the timeframes are real and all the Christmas parties are real and all those things are important, trying to center what matters most is what the challenge is for. And just so you know, the challenge, the Christmas challenge is also, we're, we're being joined in the challenge from 33 different countries, 88 different churches, and about 7,000 people so far have joined up in the challenge around the world. Isn't that amazing? So we're gonna be doing this as the Meeting House as a church and also recognizing that many, many, many other churches around the world are also going to be joining us in centering Jesus, in finding what matters most through the 30-day Christmas challenge. So this is just a reminder, we just literally kicking it off today. So if you haven't heard of this and you haven't signed up for this and you're just like, what's going on? Uh, you're not too late. You're actually in the very right place. As you can tell, I'm a little bit inclined that way myself. <laughs> okay, so 30-day challenge, you can sign up. The list is gonna be there. And what you can expect from the 30-day challenge are daily encouraging emails with a prayer that you can do every day just to center yourself on Jesus for the day. And uh, you can expect a weekly YouVersion Bible reading plans. What we would love for you to do is to do these plans with a friend or two. So your home church, that's a great place to begin to find somebody. Or if you already have a huddle within your home church, please use that. Or if there's just a random friend. Uh, we've done a couple of these challenges before at Infinitum. And one of my favorite stories is somebody who added an email invite to a YouVersion Bible reading plan saying, would you like to read this Bible plan with us? And they put the wrong email in. And so instead of it going to the friend they thought they invited, it went to some random person. And the random person said, I don't think I'm the person you think I am, but could I still join? It sounds great. And that person is now still part of a small group community following Jesus together. Isn't that awesome? So if you don't have anyone to do this, just make up a random email and see what happens. I mean... <laughs> You know, it's Christmas. <laughs> and then uh, there also will be some art involved in this challenge every week. Uh, Betty Dickinson is the artist and resident at Infinitum. And so she has incredible ministry of spiritual formation and art. Uh, as a matter of fact, here's uh, one of hers for this week, preparing the way. We're gonna talk about preparation and waiting uh, as a means, uh, as an actual means of finding light and truth and Jesus. And you'll see, isn't that beautiful? This is the story of Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth. We're gonna deep dive into this in a second, but this is Betty Dickinson. So every Wednesday on my Instagram, that seems to be the easiest way to do it, we will be talking, Betty and I, about how she got here from Luke's gospel. So all her paintings are centered in the narrative of Luke's gospel, Luke's version of the events of Jesus coming to earth. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation about how she prepared it, what happened in her heart as she did this thing and what she's hoping it might provoke in people who are journeying with us. Isn't that exciting? Uh, the other thing that happens during the challenge is every week we challenge you to think about how you could center the story that you're living on someone other than yourself. I know it's crazy, but it's possible. And uh, centering our stories on others is one of the great uh, things that happen in this challenge. Okay, so let's dive into the scripture uh, for the day. And this is, or the scripture for this week that we're really centering on. And this is from Luke's gospel, chapter one. And it's a bit long, but I really think that we should, since it is December, we should really just dive into the scripture itself and read through what it says. So Luke 1, five to 25, here we go. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once, 
when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born." He'll bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I love that. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. When he came out, he could not, oh, oh, when he came, what? Is this, a, is this the right slide? <laughs> when he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them. Yeah, we've read this before, right? Everyone awake? This is just a test. This is a test. All right, so this is the story before the story, if you know what I mean. So many, many years ago, about like a lot of years, I don't even want to tell you how many years ago. I was about 21 years old. I decided to backpack around Israel for three months. And I was pretty poor, so I did it on like a dollar a day. It was like falafel a day for me. I stayed in all the like, you know, uh, uh, cheapest place that I could find. And, and uh, while I was over there, my dad came to visit me. And thankfully, he also likes to stay in the cheapest places he can find. So that's what we were doing. And we were in the Sinai, actually. We were uh, in the Sinai. And we thought, while we're here, we really should climb Mount Sinai, because that's a thing, right? Moses did that. And there was like, there was a big thing. That's where he got the Ten Commandments from. And so we thought this would be a really cool thing. But when we looked into it, the tour price to go uh, on and climb Mount Sinai was so expensive. Neither of us could stomach it. We really like just couldn't afford it. And the tour, of the official tour of Mount Sinai is you go to sort of the front side of Mount Sinai, the proper side, and there's sort of the switchback trail. You hop on a donkey and the donkey, you know, slowly works its way up Mount Sinai. You do it in the middle of the night, you know, early in the morning while it's still dark so that when you get to the top, this little monk guy whose whole life calling is to welcome pilgrims to Mount Sinai will make you a cup of tea. You'll drink your cup of tea while you're at the top of Mount Sinai and then you'll watch the sunrise over the desert, over the Sinai desert. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Like, let's do that, except we couldn't afford it. So we're talking about this, like we can't afford the price tag on that tour. And uh, thankfully there was a taxi cab driver there and he was like, I got a deal for you. I can actually take you to the other side of Mount Sinai. So there's a backside of like stairs kind of in, that have been hedged in there by this monk at the top. And I can take you there and I can take you for like a fraction of the price. It would just be like, and then I'll meet you there again in the morning. And we're like, what? Another way up Mount Sinai for like cheap? We're in. So we pay this guy like a fraction of the cost and he takes us as another English guy named Cliff that joins us and he takes us to the other side of Mount Sinai, the back side of Mount Sinai, and drops us off and says, like, I'll be here in the morning, and the trail's kind of right there. So we're like, okay, so we get out. And I don't know if you've ever been in the desert at night, probably not, we're Canadians, but it's dark. Like, I mean, it is pitch 
black, dark. Like you cannot see your hand in front of your face. And we didn't really realize that until the taxi cab driver drove away because with him went all the headlights. And we remember just the three of us standing at the backside of Mount Sinai in the dark, completely in the dark going like, I guess... I guess we find our way up. And so we just found like literally crawling. At one point, Cliff was like, wait a minute, I have a flashlight. And he pulls out a pen from his pocket, clicks it. And we're like, oh, thank God we're saved. Now we can see like a millimeter into the darkness. You know, whoo, the light has come, you know. <laughs> and anyway, we just like hand and foot, you know, just like hand crawled over the, this thing, the back of Mount Sinai. Uh, my dad jokingly refers, because there are a couple of scary moments, and my dad says, you can't even make it up this mountain without breaking commandments, you know. <laughs> True enough. And so thanks, thanks for the grace of God, you know. But anyway, we make it, and we're at the top joining all these other, like, you know, wealthier pilgrims. And we get the chai tea, you know, and we sit on the top of Mount Sinai, and we, and we watch the sunrise. And um, I remember it so clearly because I don't know how many sunrises you've seen, but, like, oftentimes what you see before you see the sun is, like, the glow, right? You see a glow. You see color. You see something happening, and then you see the sun, but in, in the desert, what happens is you really don't really quite see the glow the same way. What happens is it looks as though the, the, the sand is catching fire. That's what it looks like. So you're watching this like desert and you know the sun is rising, but what's actually really happening is like the sand becomes alive. It like fills with light. It's like the sand, you can actually almost feel the heat and the light like igniting the sand up with this kind of energy. And then eventually you see the sun and then the sun is blazing hot and you wish it would go away. But this is the sunrise, you know. In, in, in so many ways in the, the, the narrative of Jesus coming, you know, this fullness of the promise of God, the sun rising with healing in his wings. That's what Isaiah 58 describes it as. In so many ways, this encounter with Zechariah and Elizabeth is one of those desert on fire moments. It, it, it's not quite the fullness of the promise yet, but there's something lighting up the dark places. The, the, the sun is beginning to rise. The, 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 the promise is beginning to be realized, but not quite there, but there's some fiery bits happening in the desert sands of the time in which they lived and maybe also in the time in which we live. That's what's happening. It's been a long time of waiting a long time of waiting, a season of preparation. 400 years from the Old Testament to the New Testament, generation after generation after generation. And when we pick up this story, Zechariah is doing what Zechariah is supposed to do. He's a priest. And so he is doing the thing that he needs to do in the waiting. He's preparing. Now, I, I don't know how you feel about waiting, but I don't like it. Anyone? I mean, I, I just, I don't like it. I don't like waiting. But there is something going on in the scripture around time, waiting as preparation. So in the scripture, there's kind of two words that kind of, that, that connote time. The first is chronos. In scripture, when you, when you read the word time, chronos is one of those words. And chronos is the chronological passing of time. It's it's the uh, quantity of time. It's, it's literally what you're going like, I, I wonder how long this message is gonna be, right? Tick tock, tick tock, is she getting somewhere soon? Okay, that's the chronos time. Kairos is the other word for time. And kairos is not the quantity of time, it's the quality of time. So this is really interesting. So in scripture, wherever you see this like suddenly, or like, you know, and you're just like, there was this long, 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 long journey. And then it's like, ta-da, suddenly something happens. That's a Kairos moment in scripture. Now I used to think, and I think I still have this internal battle within me that Kronos and Kairos time are up against each other. You know, that Kairos time is what really, really matters. And all the Kronos time is just a wasted passing of time, right? But what I've come to understand through the scriptural story and through the Bible itself is that you never get Kairos moments without a fair bit of Kronos time. Kairos and Kronos are not, uh, in, are not against each other. They're with each other. They happen in, uh, in connection to each other, in partnership with each other. In other words, like unless we're actually in time, unless we're actually in the preparation, unless we're actually doing the things in real time, in real space, in real life, the Kairos never comes. 
And sometimes what we can do is just like be paralyzed uh, by the chronos time. We can just be paralyzed by it because we're expecting God to come. You know, we all know that joke about the guy caught in the flood. He's just like, oh, God's gonna rescue me. And then a helicopter comes, right? We all know that one. I'm not even gonna tell it. It's so boring. But it's that. It's that we think the kairos time happens outside of our time and space, and it does not. It happens right within it. It's an invasion of eternity into the present tense. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because waiting is not wasted. It matters because waiting is not a wasted thing. Waiting, if we wait correctly, can be preparation for those eternal moments in our lives. Waiting, the definition of waiting is this, to stay in place in expectation of to stay in place in expectation of. So that's interesting because that's not passive. And one of the problems that I have with waiting is that it feels passive. It feels like I'm not doing anything. And as a matter of fact, I think in this season, this cultural moment, waiting is like almost something I have no practice of because I get everything I want at the tip of my finger. I mean, I don't even bother going to stores anymore because the lineups are too long. So I just order it to my house. Right? I mean, literally on a TikTok video, which is only three minutes maximum of length, it will say, please watch until the end. <laughs> I'm always like, how sad is this? Somebody has to write me a petition to please watch the full three minutes because I don't have the time, right? I mean, we are literally trained in this like instant results. And we see waiting as passive, but what if waiting is not passive? What if waiting in a, in a biblical sense, in, a, in an invitation from God, in a divine sense, is, is, is about something more? What if it's actually about refining us to place what matters most at the center of our lives? Well, Rich Velotis uh, wrote recently a quote that I loved. He said, what God does in us as we wait is often more important than what we're waiting for. Whoa, let me read that again. What God does in us as we wait is often much more important than what we're waiting for. What do, what do I mean? What is redemptive about waiting? Well, here's a couple things. Waiting can make our values clearer. Waiting can expose our motives. Waiting can strengthen our resolve. Most of these, uh, by the way, values clearer and expose our motive happen a lot to me when I'm waiting in traffic. <laughs> anyone, anyone, <laughs> right? When I'm just like stuck and I just, and those things that are on the inside of me often have nothing to do with the driver that cut me off or the person that's driving too slow. It has everything to do with the stuff that's on the inside of my heart my impatience about where I am currently in life, or my desire to put function above relationship, or my own anxieties working their, themselves out, or maybe it's about grief or frustration in my own life. And then it's like, it happens for me when I'm on a highway or when I'm in a traffic stop and someone just will not put their signal light on and I'm forced to wait a little bit longer and something begins to bubble up and it comes to the surface. Waiting can be preparation. It can be a, a revelation of our fears. I'll, I'll think about uh, Zechariah doing his duty, his preparation, his priestly routine, praying every year, taking his turn at the temple, but frustrated, maybe fearful, or maybe disappointed. Maybe what comes up for him in the waiting is just this dull ache that maybe the promise is not going to come that maybe God is not going to show up. These things rising up to the surface, whatever he's invited to pray. Uh, many years ago, 1972, Stanford did a very famous psychological study called the Marshmallow Test. Do you know this? You can Google this and there's really amazing videos about this. So basically the marshmallow test was a test about how impulse control was related to successfulness later on in life. So what they did was they would put five or six year old kids in a room with one marshmallow and they would say, here you go. You can have this marshmallow now or if you wait for an undisclosed amount of time, I will return and if you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll give you two and you can have two marshmallows, up to you. 
and then the test would begin. And then what they did as a study is they said they measured the impulse control, so the kids that waited with sort of, then later on they would study them again in high school and then later on in university and then later on in their careers. And they made a direct correlation between success and impulse control, their ability to wait for it. The problem is, is that later on, they revisited the study as we have revisited a lot of studies because what they realized was there was a fault in the study. The fault wasn't that the study was done wrong. The fault was that the premise of impulse control was based on kids that were chosen for the study all coming from the same socially economic background. They all came from middle class or upper middle class homes. What they discovered is that if you redo that study with kids from different backgrounds, that maybe the actual motive of impulse control is not the problem. Maybe their conditioning of what to expect when someone offers you a promise or what to expect if you grew up in a scarcity of resources that even if the person offering you that promise is trustworthy, the promise itself is not. And so eating that marshmallow, getting what you want and what you have now is just wise instead of waiting for something that won't come. Oh, why this matters, I think, is I wonder if the waiting, the preparation that God is asking us to do to put Jesus at the center of our lives, if that preparatory waiting activity that's happening in our life is just a religious one, it's just like, I should do this. Like Zechariah, it seems like this is my, my duty. This is what Christians do. This is what I should do, is predicated by this, uh, this lack of, of trustworthy relationship that is part of our upbringing in Christ. In, in other words, what I mean is that if we don't have a solid relationship with Jesus, if we don't know that our Father is good, if we don't understand that God's provision, he has more than enough, we're not in a scarcity model where we're like Oliver asking for more, please, on the streets of England, that, that we actually live in a God, a family of God with abundance, with more than enough for what we need, with strength and grace and truth and freedom for us on a daily basis, daily bread for us. If we haven't cultivated a relationship with God where he is good and he is showing up in ways that that we couldn't have even expected or in different ways that we couldn't have even imagined, if we don't have that cultivated in our life, then our impulse control is not the problem. It's, it's our value system. It's, our, it's living in scarcity or religious impulse that's the problem. And this goes back to motive. It goes back to the conditions of our life. Have we nourished a relationship with God? Have we prepared and waited in a posture that opens ourselves up to the parenting of God, to the presence of God in our daily lives? Or is our waiting or our preparation or our prayers just a duty-bound religious activity? Yeah, this is the question that we really, we want to ask. This preparation is waiting. How can it be that? Let's Let's go to that. How can waiting and preparation be connected in a way that makes Kronos and Kairos friends with one another? Let's figure this out. How does waiting become preparation for Jesus to come? And here's a few things I wanna suggest. Healthy habits. So these are rhythms and faithfulness to prayer. What I mean is that while we're waiting, <laughs> we can begin to cultivate a relationship with Jesus that is true and good, a rhythm, a steadiness to our lives. And this happens through really healthy habits, rhythms and faithfulness to prayer. You know, it's funny, I always want God to speak to me, but it's amazing, God often speaks to me when I make time for him to speak. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but when we find Zechariah in the story, he's not just randomly walking in a field, he's in the temple praying. He has set a time, a time and a place. He has positioned himself in such a place. Now he's unexpectedly received an angel because his heart maybe wasn't uh, totally open to God showing up because he'd been doing this so much. But there is something about showing up in healthy habits and rhythms of prayer, setting aside time, doing it together. 
If it wasn't for the other priests in the company of Zechariah's life, he probably wouldn't have been the one at the center in the Holy of Holies burning incense. They chose him to do that. They collectively decided to make this job something they would do faithfully. Your healthy habits, your rhythms and faithfulness to prayer will matter. It will be Kronos time and creating opportunity for the Kairos moment of God to show up. You want to hear from God? You want to know God? You want to sense Jesus? You want to sense the promises of God? You're going to need this, by the way, in life. You're going to need to cultivate this robust relationship with God where he shows up with his assurance and his promises on a regular basis. And this is how it happens. Relationships, we're in this together. None of us are called to a solo life with Jesus. Jesus invites us into community. So doing this with each other, healthy habits of rhythms and prayer will matter. Opening to God's revelation. Uh, this is where we see Zacharias really struggling because he's closed. Now, I want to show you a picture by an artist uh, named Fujumo, Makoto Fujumo. And uh, this is him here. Okay. So he's an artist, a uh, famous uh, Japanese artist. And he wrote, um, he wrote a letter to a group of kids, uh, high schoolers, about art and seeing. And I want to just read a couple of um, things. He said that actually the first thing that you do when you look at art is you look at it with the eyes of a child. Okay, the first thing that you do is you look at it with eyes of a child. And then the other thing he says is like, 10 minutes isn't going to do it. You're going to need a good 20. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting for 20 minutes in front of one picture, trying to see through the eyes of a child? I mean, maybe you can. I can't even imagine. I'd be like tapping out it too. I'd be like, okay, I get it. There's a couple gold pieces that like, you know, there's blue, there's yellow. And he just says, I want you to sit there and I want you to look long, longer. And he says this, my friend and fellow artist, Bruce Herman says, if you want to understand something, learn to stand under it. If you stand over it, you are overstanding. You're bringing in your preconceptions and presuppositions and not understanding. He says, if you've been standing or understanding in front of my work, your eyes will see more than when you came in in the beginning. Now simply spend more time looking. Perhaps you will see beyond the colors that you thought you saw at first. You might see that the works are all done with Nihonga, Japanese style painting, with layers and layers of pulverized minerals as well as gold and silver. The lily painting has 60 layers of azurite and malachite, and the colors refract. So if you let them, your eyes are able to detect prismatic colors surrounding the pigments. These individual grains of pigment are literally prisms creating rainbow refractions. Some of you will be able to see that after perhaps 20 minutes or so. <laughs> wow. When we open our hearts to understand instead of overstand God, the promises of God, the revelation of God, it is a preparation in the waiting. It is waiting as preparation. Zechariah, of course, hears God and starts to overstand. This doesn't make any sense to my rational mind. This can't be. It's too late. It's too hard. This isn't a thing that's supposed to happen. I maybe should die now because I've encountered an angel. You know, there's all these things going on in his rational mind because he's overstanding instead of opening himself to understand. How could this happen? Opening ourselves to the impossibility of God showing up in our darkest moments, in our longings, in the places that we've long forgot about or lost hope for, where we've adapted to the one marshmallow because we think it's too late and too hard for God to show up with the more. This happens in our relationships and in our minds and in our hearts, in our deepest fears inside of ourselves, our longing for healing and wholeness to come, grace and truth, to arise to the surface, to deal with the impurities that the waiting and preparation will rise up in us. But what an opportunity to begin to see the light emerge in the world, in our world. What an opportunity for us to see the light of God emerge in our minds, to open us up for possibility. There's a couple other things on that list I just want to end with. And it's simply this, silence. 
Now, when you read that passage of scripture, you may be tempted like me to think that Zechariah is being punished. Because you did not believe this now, you won't be able to speak. Although if you remember, Zechariah did ask for a sign. <laughs> it turns out the sign is that he can't speak. The sign is that he can't speak. And oftentimes we are so busy trying to fill the space, trying to explain the mystery, trying to understand, trying to talk out loud, trying to debrief, why this, why that? How about this? How could this? And we try in our own human capacity to understand. Sometimes we just need a heavenly being to shut our mouths so we could listen instead. So we could listen instead, so we could behold the mystery that is unfolding so we could stop trying to explain it all or try to justify it all and just open ourselves up to what it is that God is doing in the world and that we get to be witnesses of it. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that in all scripture, and we're gonna talk about this in the coming weeks, but in all scripture, there's what's called a movement of power. Now, I took a course a little while ago called Decolonizing the Bible. It's just simply this, that oftentimes the Bible has been both translated and read and taught by people with the most power. And so sometimes the way that we even present the texts and the way that we read the texts is influenced by that power dynamic. And one of the ways we can look at the text in a fresh way is we can look for where God is moving the power. Okay, this is really exciting because what happens if you read this passage of scripture again, which I hope you will do in your home church and really look at this movement of power in a way that I don't have time to do uh, all the way this week, but wait for it because it comes in every part of the Bible. There's a movement of power. It starts with King Herod. It goes to Zechariah, who is a male priest who has the power and even the access into the Holy of Holies, which no one else has access to, right? It moves from Zechariah to Elizabeth, who is a woman who is outside of that power structure in those days, and particularly a barren woman who is even more outside, who is disgraced, the scripture tells us. So we're moving and moving and moving. Eventually, it's actually gonna center on John, who is a little baby who's called to actually be a prophet in the wilderness, not a priest in the temple. So we see now the power is moving even further. Now it's moving out of the center, out of the, the palace to the temple, to a man priest, to a woman baron, to a baby John with a prophetic calling. And then we'll see eventually it's gonna move even further in the Christmas story to Mary, a teenage girl, to Jesus, uh, who is going to be born outside of all of the power structure, which is what's gonna make it so impossible to believe that he's the one that's gonna change everything everywhere. This is the movement of power in the text. And this is the movement of power of the gospel happening all the time. And why this is good news for you is because even if you feel like you have no power, even if you feel like you're on the, like you're invisible, you're not part of the main narrative of the story, even if you feel like you're not good enough or you've never done successful things like this before, or even if you just think like, I'm so bad at reading my Bible every day, or even if you just think like, God's not gonna use me because I'm not worthy or I'm, I'm too broken or I'm too whatever, I've got good news for you. God is moving the power. He has always been moving the power and he is always still moving the power and he is moving the power even today to put the power on the least likely person to say, I'm gonna empower you with my spirit to be a witness. And that's what he's still doing. He's doing it today. And he's inviting us to join him in that movement of power. <laughs> wow, this is such good news. You see how this becomes really good news? Who's invisible? Who's at the margins? Who seems to not matter? Who seems like their voice doesn't count? Who seems like they're not enough? Who feels like they're uninvited? Well, I've got good news for you. The gospel, the power to change everything in every way is moving straight towards you. Yeah, and there's more to come on this Christmas challenge, but this is what we're inviting you to, to not just listen, not just spectate, not just go, oh, that was a good word, but to enter in to a real preparation, awaiting with expectancy for God to speak to you in quiet moments, for God to silence you, to behold a mystery that seems impossible, for God to give you childlike eyes to see it again, but to understand it instead of over-explain it. The God who wants to open your hearts to experience all that he has in his grace and his truth being present with us, the Son setting fire to the deserts of our life. Can you feel it? Can you see it? He's coming. We got 
three minutes for questions and answer. And I'm just gonna check to see if there's a good one here and then I'm gonna eat these marshmallows. <laughs> They've been killing me this whole preach long. I'm like, there's marshmallows, I should eat them. How do you move from feeling like praying and devotions is a ritual obligation to feeling like a healthy habit? Yeah, so this is, I think uh, this is a wonderful question, by the way, thank you to whoever sent it in. One of the things I would say is that there is a season of developing the habit that does not feel, that does feel like a, a religious ritual. There is a season where it feels like because you're developing, this is true of all habits, by the way. If you haven't read Atomic, Atomic Habits, you should. It's, it's classic uh, stuff in there. But there's a moment that within that ritual, your heart stays open. You experience the freedom that the discipline offers you. The only way that I can really explain this is uh, I was running uh, for years and years and years. I ran mostly just to eat what I wanted. <laughs> so it was legitly just a caloric count. I would put my watch on and put a certain amount of time because I needed to run that amount of time in order to actually eat the ice cream for dinner. So that's what I did. And um, it felt really, really constricted and religious and I just did it. I didn't like it. It wasn't super good for me, but it just, I, it allowed me a freedom in other parts of my life. And so I did it. And then I remember after doing this for a while, I, I, I forgot my watch. And I remember thinking, oh no, you know, it won't count if you don't count it, right? <laughs> Anyone have one of those? Like, it's not like you took the steps if it's not counted on a watch. So I left my, I, I just, I couldn't find it. And I was like, well, I'm gonna go for this run. And I remember going for this run without the watch and something happening. Uh, and what happened was on the, on the run, it was very Eric Liddell, the heavens open, the like music, everything slowed down. Da, na, 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 na. I was free. I was free. I, and I don't know what happened. I just, I think I put enough time in that whatever that thing is that runners used to say, that like there is a moment that you get to where all of a sudden you don't feel like you're doing a discipline, but you feel free, that happened to me. It happened to me, and it didn't happen to me every single time after that, but it happened to me that one time. And what happened was that discipline, that routine, that habit actually turned into this free, free place for me. And after that, I never really ran again the same way. I always ran wanting that moment instead of just the caloric burn. Does that make sense? I think the same thing happens in prayer. It's, it's in that chronological, that chronos time where kairos moments happen, where you sense the presence of God, where you feel God moving, where you know that God is close to you, that it turns that rhythm, that habit into actually space and time for the quality of time to spend with God. And once you taste that, you understand that this is actually how kairos moments happen through our own healthy habits. All right. If you haven't had a chance to sign up for the challenge, it starts today, so please join us. Join us from 33 different countries trying to center Jesus during this time. But right now, I wanna pray for you. This is the Apostle Paul writing in Ephesians 1. I just invite you to close your eyes. God, we pray that the eyes of our heart will be enlightened set the desert of our lives on fire so we could know the hope that you've called us to. So that we would know the riches, the abundance, the more than enough of your glorious inheritance in us your holy people. And may we know your great power for us who believe. Let our waiting be preparation for your kairos, for your fire, for your announcement, for your invitation for what matters most, Jesus, amen.